Uh, let's bring Alan and Anna up on stage. All right, fantastic. So it looks like we have everybody here. Um, I'm gonna ask Alan and Anna to just briefly introduce themselves um, as they hop on screen and then um, we can get started. So Anna, can you introduce yourself and tell us a couple of lines about yourself? So hello everyone, super excited to be here today and, and uh, present our engine and everything. So I'm scientific director at IMAC and IMAC is a semiconductor company with headquarters in Belgium, but we also have a branch in the United States and I'm here in Kissimmee, Florida in the United States. So my background is in solid state physics, uh, uh, but later on by career, I became a circuit designer, from circuit designer, I became system engineer, from system engineer, I became PI on the big projects. So a little by little, I was connecting those between different disciplines and different things. So here in Florida, I'm responsible for R&D team. And this R&D team is developing advanced circuits for the future AI and the future 6G communications. So thank you. Great. Alan, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Hi. Good, everybody. Um, Alan Rudolph. I'm the chief technology officer of the CoY Engine. And uh, my affiliation is with the uh, lead organization, Innisphere Ventures, which is a 25-year-old incubation accelerator in the front range of Colorado, operating in biotech and clean tech. Uh, I sat on the board of Innisphere for 10 years, but chronologically, I left uh, Colorado State University as their vice president of research last summer, spending a decade in my only academic chapter. Um, before then, uh, I was working in the Obama administration, so I was in government. Um, had experience at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, and uh, helped establish your life sciences. I'm an evolutionary biologist by training. Um, and uh, I started my career in a national lab, the Naval Research Lab, the first one founded by Thomas Edison in Washington, D.C. Um, so, yeah, glad to be here. That's a little bit of my background. Great. Fantastic. So I'll get started with a question for both of you. Um, how did you get involved with the NSF engine proposal? And what was the first step your team did around building a coalition? So do you remember those early days and how you found out about this opportunity and how you got involved? So Alan, why don't you start? And then Ann, I'll, I'll have the same question to you. Well, when the first announcement came out for at the engines directorate and the programs, uh, we mobilized right away and decided um, first that we were gonna go directly to a type two. Um, I was the vice president of research at Colorado State at the time and was able to take advantage. I forgot one chapter in my history, I biotech CEO. So I spent a decade starting companies. So for me, it was uh, with a small group, a, a bit of a labor of love of uh, stitching together unique constituencies to go after the, uh, the proposal. Um, having had national lab experience, there are 30 national labs in the front range. Six of them are in our engine. Uh, corporations uh, well known in our region around aerospace, biotech, but environmental sensing is the theme. And in fact, our engine is, is climate resilience. Um, another big passion of our engine in coming together was the fact that many of us had experienced uh, climate change in very unique ways. I was uh, evacuated in the mandatory historic fire of the Cameron Peak. Uh, we had the Marshall fires. Uh, so aridification in our region uh, is well known to all of our constituents and the passion of going after a grand challenge over 10 years that lives in our backyard was I think how we all got involved. It starts with purpose and uh, we were able to identify a small group across sectors unique to our region um, that identified these passions early to pursue this opportunity. Go ahead, Anna. Well, my case is a little bit different since uh, I was not from the beginning of an NSF proposal. So, and the, the uh, Central Florida NSF engine is actually pretty unique because it was organized by the county. And it was county conscious decision 
to shift the economy in the central Florida to the semiconductors. So for most of you in the audience, the semiconductor associated with the Bay Area and California and, and all this stuff. So you would ask what the semiconductors are doing in uh, Florida. And they're doing a lot and they're actually doing very well, but it was all started by the county. It was a conscious decision to change economy in the central Florida towards this direction. And it was county who attracted high tech companies like I'm like my company to this particular place. And it was county who built the clean room that built chips and packages in this particular place. So when I joined uh, this community, I would not say an engine with this community. So this community was already functioning pretty much like an engine. It was county, it was uh, fab, it was workforce development, local colleges, universities, they all united. And the fantastic thing about it, that I found it moving from Belgium to here. So that these people uh, pretty much don't need to do that. Yes, it's not their day job to do that. So they united to change the community in Central Florida and they all work together. So it was fascinating for me as a being a new person for this community. And uh, at that point, uh, NSF engine proposal was already one third into the way and formed. And I joined it. And of course I supported it from our company perspective. So, and we started to have the meetings together and work together and shape it together and so on. But uh, uh, that's, uh, that's my journey. Uh, personal one into the NSF engine. And this is a little bit of a story behind the Central Florida engine. Yeah, that's yeah. great. That's a fantastic segue into my next question, which is you both are coming from slightly non-traditional entities when you think about the National Science Foundation, which historically you know, has been funding a lot of academic institutions and also some of the groups around it. But you know, as you know, about 40% of our awardees in round one of the competition were nonprofit entities. So can you talk to us a little bit about the role that you all played in pulling together your coalition and how your region decided that, you know, the entities that led it, whether it was, you know, what we saw in Central Florida or in Colorado and Wyoming, that this was the right institution to lead the coalition of a diverse set of stakeholders. So Alan, why don't we go back to you and Anna, you can take this question as well. Yeah, and it's a great question because you're absolutely right. With even though it was a new director at NSF, the S, uh, the Science Foundation, and their traditional work with academics, um, it took us a, a little while to get ourselves together to say we really want to put a unique organization in the lead of this. Uh, and it was a bit of a cultural uh, transition, right? Because as you point out. Uh, your agency doesn't have a reputation in, in the area it's currently funding. So it took a bit of convincing for the academic R1s in our region. But, um, you know, Innisphere Ventures, uh, with this long track record of incubation of companies from ideas to scale in areas adjacent to the climate resilience, our theme, uh, clean tech, um, really provided, I think, the nexus to build around because we had an experienced group that had already worked with the tech transfer offices and the universities already worked with the startup communities. So building an innovation ecosystem within a, in a sphere ventures at the lead came into clarity over time, but it, it took some time. Um, and, and a bit of that adjustment, as you point out with uh, what is NSF want um, and what does success look like? Now, um, in our region, being unique with this national lab footprint, we had a second hurdle um, in the national lab structure, having been in that structure, uh, because uh, other agencies with the mandate around climate, in our case around our theme, um, don't necessarily uh, work closely with NSF. So some of the uh, future uh, and looking at the trajectory of a 10-year opportunity required us, and we are currently doing that work, to uh, educate the other trajectories of investment in, in some of the themes. In our, our case, for example, uh, an example of that would be 
how does uh, bio sources of methane from biological sources like livestock, or how does soil carbon uh, dynamics uh, contribute to uh, uh, sequestration of carbon in the soil for climate? So um, part of the work was not only to identify the lead, but understand the connective tissue behind our themes that will allow ideas to be scaled over the time frame of impact that NSF was asking for in the proposal. Um, so let me stop there and let Anna join in on her experience. Well, good and all the recommendation for our engine bridge is also not good. And I think it's very important that both organizations be included, particularly in the semiconductor industry. So uh, semiconductor industry is extremely competitive. So, and all these big companies and trillions and billions of money. And this competition actually hurts local development. It doesn't contribute to local development. So putting the nonprofit organization ahead of NSF engine and contributing it is reversing this dynamic. It allows to uh, build community around the super competitive energy. And one of the, there are multiple mechanisms that nonprofit uh, companies can bring. And I'm probably these most successful nonprofit semiconductor R&D in the world. So in the recent CHIPS Act, I met was specifically spelled out for the IP model that our company is bringing. And this IP model of a pre-competitive projects. So in the semiconductor in industry, because it's extremely, capital intensive, it actually makes sense to have a pre-competitive area when everyone benefiting from this pre-competitive area. And then later on, on the high tier levels, these technologies are moving to the different competitions and different private companies and so on. So I'm a pioneer this model about 20 years ago in Belgium, and now we're moving it to USA, and now we're trying to establish the same thing here in our engine. And the bridge is another very interesting nonprofit that has also a very important role. What do you think the bridge name is? Bridge, it's a connection between what and what? It's connection between government, uh, county government and the different companies. And that's a role of nonprofit. So, and county government and local community and community colleges and universities are involved and they need to be bridged. And that's also perfect role for nonprofit organizations that are not biased and contributing to everyone. So I think that's my five cents for nonprofit involvement. Yeah, fantastic. That's that's really helpful. And just a reminder to all of you, um, you can put questions into the Q&A for our speakers. If you have questions specifically about the solicitation, highly recommend that you email us at engines at nsf.gov or take a look at the webinar. Um, I'll be start taking, I'll start pulling some of these questions out of the Q&A to ask our speakers directly. But before we do that, I want to build on a point that Anna just closed with about the role of state and local government and the commitments that they can bring to the table and also how tribal nations are involved. I'm not, I know they're not involved in every proposal, but what was the role that your state, local government, tribal nations played in helping you build the partnerships you need, helping you build the capital stack, and thinking about the economic development needs of your region holistically? Uh, Alan, I see you nodding your head, so I'll, I'll go to you first since I know Anna <laughs> talked a little bit about this in her last remarks. Sure. Um, so uh, Colorado and Wyoming, um, both state governments are engaged at a significant level, um, engaged through the Office of Economic Development where cost share uh, was exercised. I mean, uh, Certainly, you know, states are used to cost sharing against the NSF proposals like ERCs and things like that. This was a bit unusual and still, I, I believe we're educating our state on the impacts expected from a 10 year investment from NSF in this region. Um, so uh, we also involved because many communities are developing climate plans uh, significant involvement of community. This use inspired R and D term can, you know, uh, warrant some some further refinement and definition. Clearly, cl climate change and climate resilience can mean different things to different communities. So um, there was a, 
I think an, an intentional effort to start to build in the voice of the community. And certainly Colorado and Wyoming are very different states uh, from a political, socio-political. I mean, Wyoming is very rural compared to uh, uh, Colorado. Um, and so, you know, the that kind of diversity and engaging the state communities as well as the state house was recognized. We actually uh, worked and are still working with a former governor in Colorado, Bill Ritter, who uh, is helping to bridge the state houses in you know, an area that, as you can expect, have very different views on oil and gas and renewables, but coming together uh, because of the recognition that climate change is, is re real and, and they want to address it on a community basis. Um, so the state and local governments have been very engaged uh, since day one for us, again, partly because this issue of climate for us is a very practical one, uh, given the drought in the West. And so it, it not at all hard to engage communities about their needs. Um, and so that, that's how the states ha have been engaged with us. And the, um, the other uh, entities within at least Colorado that have been engaged are the ones that pay attention to higher ed. In part, the workforce training and the workforce component of these engines obviously touches generational training. Um, and so there was engagement with the, in our case, Colorado Higher Ed Research Authority, which is a state entity in the Colorado House. There's not quite the same in Wyoming, but we've engaged again with workforce training. And then you mentioned tribes and, and uh, there's significant tribal uh, entities in Colorado and Wyoming. And very early on, and we engaged um, not just directly, but also through our partner network that was created for the engine, because the national labs in our region, uh, some of them NSF labs like NEON, already have the National Earth Observatory Network, already have relationships with tribes. Um, and then uh, just to put a, a, a sort of a fine point on that or a, an important exclamation point, we actually have tribal representation on our governance board. So, um, you know, a, a, a very significant intent, especially in, in, you know, Wyoming and Colorado where lands management is under tri significant tribal uh, uh, oversight that uh, they be included uh, and were included from the get-go of the proposal. Great. Right before we hop over to Anna, I, I just want to double down on one point that you made because I saw a question come into the chat during it. Alan, how did you get the national labs on board as partners and what were they able to contribute? I know sometimes that can be complicated as well. Yeah. And, and you know, I think, first of all, having the relationships with the national labs in the front range, there's an organization nonprofit called Colorado Labs, which kind of is a nonprofit. So, you know, there, there are connectors, but labs were chosen very specifically because of the data um, that we were interested in. And, you know, certainly the National Renewable Energy Lab or, and the National Oceanic Administration, NOAA, have significant data assets and computational um, experience and, and are interested in participating in the engine for different reasons. Some of the national labs are interested in part because of the tech transfer acceleration. Having been in a national lab, they are great sources of, of uh, discovery and innovation. It's not sometimes easy to get it out of the national lab. So they were motivated in part because we have corporates like Lockheed, Mars, Shell, uh, Trimble, and, and they saw opportunity for their, uh, their portfolios to see um, scaling opportunities that perhaps uh, without the engine wouldn't be present. I will say, you know, I mentioned it earlier, I think in our case, the national lab presence the, the NSF labs are straightforward, like NCAR and NEON, but, you know, USDA labs, DOE labs, NIST, uh, NOAA, um, these are going to require longer term over 10 years uh, interactions with their, you know, agency leads to understand how, how the engine both influences and impacts some of the things that they're already funding. Um, and I wouldn't say we have all the answers. I, I think moving money from NSF to another national lab 
is not straightforward. A lot of the national labs are in kind and are partnering with our corporates uh, and we're amplifying projects that they're already engaged in in our community and act in, in, in the academic uh, sector. Great. So we'll turn it over to Anna and it'd be great if you could talk about some of the commitments um, that you were able to bring in from state and local government and others. I know you all didn't have some of the challenges that Alan referenced because you are a single part of a state, you know, a, a sub-region of a state as opposed to crossing over state lines. But before I turn it over to you, I just want to make one clarification. You know, we're asking applicants to think about commitments from additional sources of capital. That's different than cost share. I know NSF is a very specific definition of cost share. So I saw some questions come in. So I just want to clarify that, that we are looking for additional outside commitments to amplify our investments. And that's a, a, a separate thing from cost share. And I know Anna would love to hear you talk a little bit about uh, what the different partners at the state level and the local level were able to bring to bear as you all were building your application and your, your engine in Central Florida. and the decision that happened before the engine and that decision didn't was just decided that we're going to do something about it this decision was coming with significant investment from the the county side so the county in general before even engine started and before the federal government started to put other projects on it i think it was about 300 million total county investment into that particular place so the county built uh, the clean room, that is the heart of the engine right now. This is advanced packaging facility. The county built a new high school that is a uh, fourth right now in the state, the best uh, uh, STEM school. County also built the lab and the office building when I am right now and continue to invest with many buildings and so on. In addition to that, there was a Again, prior to the NSF engine, huge investment in workforce development. So Osceola County was known as being the almost to the worst county in terms of percentage of kids going to the college. I forgot 36 or 37, so close to the end of all counties in Florida. So there was a conscious commitment also from the county to start a new program that guarantees tuition to the community college for every single graduate, high school graduate of the county. And um, as a result of this program, right now, the Osceola County, where we are right now, is the number four in the state after five years in number of the high school graduates that go into the college. So that was a beginning investment, and that investment created this coalition and bring the high tech company like ours. And that was a foundation for NSF engine. But NSF engine by itself, and we already see it, is amplifier. After NSF engine started to get traction and we have to work together. So the state investment invested in another 17 million in the, in the test lab that is going in, in the new city. There is a huge grant in the workforce development from the state. And in the same time, all this visibility and strength of coalition attracting a lot of federal government. So I think that right now we we bring all together significant amount of federal grant from the Chips Act, from the Department of Energy, from the DOD, and many different federal agencies. So, and uh, the more we grow the more visibility it is, the more commitment from the local government and state in it. So it is amplifier. So I think NSF engine is amplifier, a, a multiplier, an amplifier of the initial state. Yeah, another question that came in through the chat while you were talking. Can you tell us a little bit about how you all play in the pre-competitive space? Like how do you get universities and investors and others to come in and be excited about things if they perhaps don't have the ability to immediately pull it out and bring it into, you know, their company. Um, or how, you talk a little bit about how you all exist in the pre-competitive space. Could you share with others how you've been approaching that? Well, yes, it's always complicated and it depends on particular technology and particular things. So I can only talk about uh, semiconductor technologies and how it works in a semiconductor. Field. So in a, again, 
And so in semiconductor technology, first of all, it's extremely capital intensive. You need this clean room that costs 300 million and so on. So you need a lot of equipment that costs even more millions that is in this clean room and highly educated workforce and so on. So it's not like companies can afford to do it by, by themselves. So they're forced to join their effort into one small ecosystem. But of course, up to a certain level. So it makes sense up to a certain level. And I would say TRL 7, technical rating 7 and higher, this is already going in competitive zone. Everything below that, that can reside in a pre-competitive zone when people benefit each other developing basic technologies. And the product and the system in particular specification going already in competitive zone. Right. So, so that's my kind of answer for that. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll go with Alan on this next question. Alan, can you talk to me a little bit about how baked your leadership team was at the time of your application and how has that changed since the application as you're getting into the work and learning? Uh, just talk a little bit about the evolution of the leadership team. There's been some questions about, you know, how did you decide who's the CEO? How do you decide on co-PIs? How has that changed as you learn more in this process? Yeah, um, it's a great question in, in part because you know, putting a team together to go after the proposal and, and it was a two year journey to get to, you know, a decision on award, uh, things change. Um, in other words, the people who have a hand in constructing uh, sometimes, uh, you know, aren't, aren't as involved uh, once you get going for a variety of reasons, in part because you're starting to refine ideas as you move forward. Um, so, for us, as I said, it was the first hurdle was getting to a nonprofit incubator accelerator to Innisphere, and then uh, realizing that uh, putting that lead in uh, requires some experience in handling a large grant and all the compliance measures associated with uh, a, a transdisciplinary complex grant like this, especially with corporates and national lab partners and R1s, community colleges, as well as associations. So uh, choosing the leadership team a, a little bit is at the beginning of who believes, uh, right? I mean, uh, you know, we all know the probabilities of success at the outset are quite low. Um, and then uh, convincing ourselves that even if the lead uh, doesn't have all the experience because Innisphere never handled a grant of this size that the support immediate support executive team around it knew enough to support that lead as it starts to get more and more experience and of course you know there are uh, vendors that you can turn to for compliance help co companies like Huron uh, but fundamentally it was getting to that belief state in the original team um, and, and mostly, frankly, because of the nature of working with NSF, uh, it, it fell largely to a more academic-like group that understood, you know, sort of the NSF speak, if you will. And even though it's a new program, understood research administration from a fairly typical NSF. I don't think that was required, but it helped us quite a bit. So in my case, since I was one of the leads, getting Colorado State's uh, Office of Sponsored Programs to, you know, sit alongside our lead at the beginning really helped a lot. Uh, just sort of, you know, educate them to the point where they felt comfortable in even pursuing it. The governance board's been something of a bit of an evolution. Um, we started out taking, you know, the R1s and, and the and you know, putting them on the governance, governance board. We do have two VPRs. My position was a co-PI. Alan, can you just, now, those of you who don't know, can you just describe those abbreviations? You just used R1 and the VPR. Oh, you just call that out for folks. Sure, sorry. R1 is a Research One University, um, so significant portfolio of research. A VPR is a vice president of research office, which, you know, in... in Many cases, a research one university will have an office that's handled a very large, complex proposal and understands, you know, how to get it in, um, because you know that that's not easy. And and the CEO in our case is the CEO of Innisphere, who understands very well 
you know, this idea to scale and, and, and networks quite well in terms of the innovation ecosystem in our region. So we, we actually um, benefited from having a pretty solid executive team going into this. I noted when I went to the kickoff in March, there were other engines even once awarded that were still looking for CEOs. Um, and, you know, my recommendation would be, you know, the sooner you can identify your leadership team, the better off you'll be. And in our case, we were fortunate to pretty much go into the award with a, I would say, an 80% uh, executive leadership team. Now, the Research One uh, vice presidents of research, uh, in uh, actually in Boulder's case, University of Colorado Boulder, it's a vice president of tech transfer. But my uh, replacement at Colorado State is the co-PI. So we have, uh, and and as well as University of Wyoming's vice president of research, research Parag Chitness. So, um, in our case, the co-PIs are the research one universities in our region, and uh, they helped a lot in sort of getting this up. The governance board, which we may talk about subsequently, is a little bit different, and that's still a little bit of an evolution uh, where you want some independent board members as well, and our co-PIs are, are observers on our governance board. Great. Um, question in the chat that I'll direct to Anna. Uh, how did you decide who you all wanted to partner with, how do you bring them into the fold? And then what do you ask them for? You know, some people are contributing cash, others are contributing expertise, others are making in-kind contributions. So one, how did you decide who you wanted at the table alongside of you all on the team? And then two, when you're asking them to bring resources to bear, how did you make the determination of what was the most appropriate way to engage them on that front? Well, there's a and it's also what we're doing here in defining partnership model for other partners, apart from the partner of the loan proposal. So I'm going to touch on the proposal first. So proposal went with the partnership of already existing uh, strong partners uh, in Central Florida, and it was based on expertise, uh, already pre-existing expertise and collaboration here before NSF Engine. So we do have uh, University of Central Florida, University of Florida, they are very strong in semiconductors. So the engine itself is centered in advanced packaging facility by itself. It's a natural attraction of certain skills. So, and also there was a vision and the vision was to create a cross-disciplinary advanced packaging center together with workforce. So every partner who was selected for the engine was strategically selected because of this vision. So it was assembled in this way, based on expertise, of course. So that's how the proposal was done. And that's how my company, IMEC, was involved because we also work in the semiconductor industry. So going into the future, of course, we want to have more new partners. Okay? and more contributions and so on. We're actually building this model right now. That model is complicated. And uh, what we are doing right now, we're inventing some virtual projects and then virtual partners and putting them through this engine, see how it's gonna work, how the old gears that you see behind the NSF team are gonna rotate. <laughs> and if they're gonna crash this project or they're gonna, the project will survive and will be successful. So yes, yeah, so a partnership model is being defined as as it is right now. And it's one of the topics that we actively discuss in every group meeting at the leadership team. Great, Alan, I'll direct this next question to you. Um, you know, some people are on this call today who are just individual faculty members or researchers, and they're trying to think about what's the best way for them to plug in. So as you all are going through this process and talking to your partner institutions at Boulder and Colorado State University and others, how did you bring in folks who are raising their hand um, at the research level who said they are interested in engaging? Yeah. Um, well, first thing we did was, of course, refine our theme, climate resilience, uh, into, you know, specific themes. So, you know, obviously, and, and these were broad, so it gave a lot of room for individual faculty to raise their hand and say, oh, yes, water access and availability I can contribute to, or wildfire risk and mitigation I can contribute to. So, you know, I think faculty and re ideas, re research ideas can be generated by the alignment with 
the goals of the engine. We are in the construction of a tech roadmap uh, over a 10 year period to better inform uh, ourselves and our communities about directions, uh, directionality. You know, an example would be soil carbon, where uh, right now we can look at products like biochar, and in the future we can think about microbiome uh, contributions to changes in soil dynamics. So that helps, right? Because it starts to uh, set a stage for what are the areas of interest to the engine. And then um, the deployment of resources in the engine through requests for proposals or RFPs is right upon us. So um, we're, I don't know if it's a requirement of the engine, but in our engine, we'll have two types of grants, a use inspired R&D grant and a translational grant. These will be uh, allocations of resources to teams. So uh, we're running a fairly similar process pre-competitively before those RFPs come out. We've been on campuses and in our partner network saying, you know, this is coming. Here's what it's going to focus on. It's under review. At a, it will be under review at NSF. So they'll be aware. And, and that's another way that uh, people can come forward with their ideas. We'll also do sort of what, what we're experienced in, uh, in some of these large programs are sort of teaming days before uh, once the RFP is out so that people who have similar themes uh, or individual faculty who want to contribute to a team can uh, meet up and understand, uh, you know, opportunities, commonalities and opportunities uh, for responding to the RFP. Um, yeah. So even though, you know, the TRL level for things that can scale is, is greater, uh, we're always looking for, you know, a breakthrough and you know, a good example in our region is fusion energy. There's a lot of excitement about, fusion and building some you know, pilot plants to scale fusion over the next 10, 20 years. So that's a good example of even keeping on the radar potential pivots that could take place in your innovation ecosystem over a decade. Great. Um, I'm going to ask a quick follow up to Anna, and then I'm going to give you all a, a closing question that I want you to think about. So I'll give you the closing question now, which is going to be, what advice would you give to people going through this process now? Like, what did you learn along the way during the site visits, during the proposal writing and everything else? Um, but before we get to that, I'm going to give Anna a quick question, then Alan, I'll turn it to you uh, for this final question, which is, you know, given the high cost of semiconductor facilities, how are you linking the county facilities that you're building out with facilities within academic institutions, whether that's University of Central Florida, Community College, University of Florida, and others. I mean, obviously, there's going to be some things that you all are doing in your facilities, but there's other things that can happen in that academic labs. How are you determining what happens where? And then we'll go to Alan and then back to you for this final question. Well, that, that's a very easy question because uh, it's a natural, complementary nature of university labs to the advanced packaging facility. So university labs doing research, advanced packaging facility, bring this in bringing this research to low volume manufacturing level. So that's how the division between university labs and the last packaging is here in Central Florida, and it's mutually beneficial and the both have to exist. Yeah, great. All right, Alan, what advice would you give to teams based on having gone through this process one time already? Yeah, I think the advice I would give is find a common passion in your region that will bind people together in a long slog with a, a potential steep hill, being on a potential steep hill. If you don't have the passion for what drives your innovation ecosystem, it'll be hard to keep that boat, boat together. And, you know, I reflected some of the tensions and friction about, oh, this is NSF, it really should be led by an academic organization. But understanding your regional innovation ecosystem and what drives it is a key aspect. Anna talked about micro, you know, microchips in Central Florida and how it related to the history there. I talked about climate uh, change in our region because of aridification. You know, if you're, if you're on a playing field where everybody wants the ball to run, run with, in a sense, because they're active, um, that helps. And then the second piece of advice I'd give is seek out uncommon partnerships. Um, the usual suspects uh, will always appear. Uh, but in our case, I'll give you one example. Lockheed Martin's never had National Science Foundation funding. 
I, I was astonished. I thought, geez, a company like Lockheed, somewhere along the way, they would have had Skunk Works and, and been an SF engaged. But there was motivation for some in in this in this foundation of passion to get involved because there were uncommon partnerships that they weren't quite sure how they were going to benefit from, but knew they were an important component of the ecosystem. Great. All right, Anna, close us out. What did you all learn through this process? Well, what advice would you share to others? It's hard to add to Alan's words. Yes, common passion is the key, the goal. And uh, also I would like to say that uh, put your competition aside. So people really have to put their individual interest, individual organization aside and unite on a common goal and work together. So it happened here in Florida and it was fascinating. So. Great. Well, we are right at time. I want to say thank you again, Alan and Anna, for your great discussion today. Uh, wish you all the best of luck with your engines. And I know everyone on the call today benefited from hearing about the process and your learning. So thank you so much. 